the page. So now we'll transition to the topic of today's webinar, which is titled Common Workforce Challenges Identified in the Missouri Food, Agriculture, and Forestry Workforce Needs Assessment. Presenting on this topic is Dr. Mark White, who is an Associate Extension Professor, State Extension Specialist, and Interim Director of the Institute of Public Policy in the Truman School of Public Affairs. So thank you, Mark, for presenting today. If you could please start your video and unmute your microphone, then we can begin today's presentation. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Alice. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, workforce is a state priority and, and the goal of the research that uh, we're gonna present here today is to understand the long-term uh, needs and challenges facing the state. Um, for, <clears throat> in terms of this research, we, um, when we looked at food, ag, and forestry, we, we looked not just at what's going on on the farm, but we also some broadly defined food, ag, and forestry industries. And the goal really was to understand the jobs that employers in those industries need to fill over the next decade and identify some of the, the current and, and future workforce challenges that they have. To, um, and so um, we, um, to, to do this, we um, uh, took a mixed methods approach. We used a lot of uh, labor market information, so looked at employer trends and projections. Uh, we conducted an employer survey, uh, and we conducted a series of focus groups and key informant interviews. Now, a lot of the primary research, the survey, and the focus groups happened between January and, and early March of this year, so uh, kind of pre-COVID-19. Um, but really, the thought with this research is that it's uh, if we ever return to some semblance of normalcy, a lot of the challenges that we uh, that we uncovered are, are things that are going to be Lasting, uh, lasting challenges and that, that need to be addressed. Um, and so uh, as we take that longer term perspective, that's what we're looking for. Now, one of the things that we, uh, in terms of pulling together this report, uh, is we you know, delved into a lot of some of the, deep, uh, some of the issues related to some of the more detailed uh, and specific occupations and some of the challenges in filling some of those specific occupations. Uh, but today I'm gonna cover some of the broader workforce issues facing uh, food, ag, and, and forestry. Now, one of the important uh, kind of distinctions that we need to make as we, as we, uh, as we uh, examine these issues is that our focus uh, for a lot of our analysis really focuses on occupations more so than industries. Occupations are what workers do. Industries are what companies make. Um, and by looking at those occupations, we get a sense of, of, of the types of jobs and employers uh, within food, ag, and forestry need to fill. Now, uh, there's an important distinction that needs to be made when we look at these occupations, that there's uh, two types of occupations. There's occupations that are unique to food, ag, and forestry, whereas, you know, like a, a farmer, uh, for instance, uh, is going to work in uh, production agriculture. And then there are other jobs, uh, whether they're managers or, or uh, whatnot, that are in demand throughout the workforce. So as an example, uh, for example, 63% of Missouri's food scientists and technologists work within the 98 food, ag, and forestry industries. Now, by contrast, uh, food, ag, and forestry employers also employ about 2,100 truck drivers. Uh, but this represents just over 4% of the total um, people that work in that particular occupation. And this distinction is important because it, to fill these jobs requires two different types of workforce strategies. Where jobs are unique to food, ag, and forestry, uh, we need to create a workforce to fill those jobs. And that means engaging students and generating interest and awareness in these jobs uh, or providing specialized education and training opportunities. For those occupations where, where food, ag, and forestry employers are competing with other uh, employers throughout the economy, um, they need to recognize that they're competing with that and, and, uh, and, and make those jobs competitive um, uh, within that marketplace. And this can apply to anything you know, ranging from managerial positions to manual labor. Now, for those jobs that are unique, is we need to start a pipeline of people to move through. Um, and this means uh, engaging students in high school or often in middle school. Now, one of the things that we asked as part of our research, uh, we asked employers how they go about engaging youth. And 60% of the employers that we uh, surveyed uh, mentioned that they worked with groups like 4-H or FFA or other youth groups uh, to help uh, engage students or, or, or make them aware of the jobs that they have. Students in these groups are, tend to be predisposed to have an interest in agriculture, so it's a good kind of pre-screened uh, audience. In addition, career and technical education and ag education programs around the state also provide exposure as well as provide students with a lot of the basic skills they need to work in uh, 
uh, and jobs related to agriculture. Um, there are a number of challenges that come with some of these programs. One is, is access, and that students don't always have access to these programs. They also tend to be uh, more prominent in, uh, in the state's more uh, rural uh, districts as opposed to the, the urban and suburban uh, districts. Um, and then there's also challenges with teacher uh, retention for a lot of these programs as well, and that um, uh, is particularly younger teachers in particular, because a lot of the skills that make someone a good ag education teacher or a good CTE teacher uh, are also uh, skills that are in demand within the private sector. <clears throat> so if people are interested in working in food, ag, and forestry, what are employers looking for? Uh, and we asked employers to identify the most difficult to find skills. And the thing that, uh, that came up uh, again and again uh, is that uh, the most common skills all relate to basic work readiness. The most common in-demand skills or difficult to find skills relate to basic work readiness. Um, and that's a matter of just finding people who are reliable and will show up to work on time. And there's very much a sense when talking to employers that if you can give us a good worker, we can train them up. Um, and this is not to say that there is not more in-demand specialized skills, whether it's you know, truck drivers or equipment operators, but uh, predominantly employers are looking for just good workers. Now, one of the reasons why there's such a priority put on work readiness is because a lot of, uh, because more than some of those specialized skills, um, is because so many of the jobs within food, ag, and forestry often do not require any kind of uh, degree or certification. Um, and again, it's give me a good worker and we can train them up. And when we looked at the typical educational requirements for the occupations within food, ag, and forestry, only about one in eight jobs required post-secondary education or post-secondary degree or certification. Almost half the jobs required high school or less and short-term on-the-job training. And we define, in this case, short-term on-the-job training is less than one month. Um, and that number is generally consistent with the overall state workforce. Where there's a big difference uh, is with, uh, it is in the jobs that require maybe a high school degree or less, but they require much more uh, experience and training. So uh, moderate on the job training or long-term on the job training, in this case, moderate on the job training is one month, one year, or long-term is more than a year. And about 40% of the food, ag, and forestry jobs fall within this category, and, and, and often more so, when you get into more uh, manufacturing related areas, such as food manufacturing or forestry wood products manufacturing. And this, again, this isn't to say that those are critical jobs that require greater levels of education, but for the majority of food, ag, and forestry jobs, the focus is much more about training than it is uh, education. So training is important. So how, you know, how do food, ag, and forestry employers use, uh, go about doing training? And, and far and away the, uh, the most common method for them to use is on the job uh, training. Now, one of the things we did in the course of our research is that we added a few questions that were the same as, as in Merit's statewide employer survey, which came out uh, last, uh, I guess, August or, or September. And that allowed us to compare food, ag, and forestry employers to employers more generally. Now, relative to employers statewide, uh, food, ag, and forestry employers are less likely to use some of the other training methods um, like flexible schedules to accommodate continuing education or in-house classroom training, vendor training, uh, online courses. Um, and uh, so they're really focused on that on-the-job training as opposed to some of those other methods. There's also differences within food, ag, and forestry as smaller firms, basically looking at firms that have less than 50 employers or employees, pardon me, are less likely to to work with community and technical colleges on things like apprenticeships or customized training programs. So in a lot of cases, they don't necessarily have the resources, maybe a bit of a small firm issue where they don't have the resources to, uh, uh, to pursue those, those issues. Um, the biggest challenge um, stated by employers uh, was, you know, uh, in terms of just the lack of time for training and then finding uh, some of those relevant uh, training options. Um, uh, to meet their needs. And those needs may be in terms of just the content or the format or, or the training. Um, so there are some challenges in finding, you know, what works for them. Now, it's hard to believe that just kind of two months ago, the biggest challenge we were facing were, uh, you know, facing employers was a tight labor market and not enough uh, applicants. Um, and now that we, you know, the, the world has kind of changed a little bit in the last two months. But one of the focuses on our report is to think about some of the longer term challenges uh, that employers face, not just today, but over the course of the next 10 years. And assuming we ever get back to a semblance of normalcy, some of those uh, same challenges will likely uh, apply. 
one of the longer term challenges that came up in some of our conversations with employers was just that there was just a lack of people or a lack of, of applicants that were uh, available. Now, since many of the, the jobs that you know, food, ag, and forestry employers seek to fill do not uh, necessarily involve significant uh, post-secondary education, they then, they, as a result, draw primarily from their local uh, or regional labor markets. People don't tend to move for, for lower paying uh, jobs. So one of the challenges that a lot of these employers face is that there's simply fewer people to draw from. So the map that's, that's there, uh, this, the size of the circle gives you a sense of the, the number of uh, wage and salary jobs in food, ag, and forestry by county. And then the color of the circle uh, tells you whether or not that county has, has gained or lost population uh, this decade over the course of the last uh, nine years. Uh, and what we find is that about over half of the jobs in food, ag, and forestry are in the 76 Missouri counties that have net population losses since 2010. Now, a lot of those jobs are in places like St. Louis City and St. Louis County, uh, where some of those population losses have been offset by growth in some of the surrounding counties like St. Charles County. But in a lot of rural areas, particularly in northern Missouri, uh, or down in the boot heel, or even smaller cities like St. Joseph, you know, one of the real challenges is that there's simply fewer and fewer people to draw from. Um, uh, you know, they're looking for people in places where there, there simply aren't people. And some of those challenges in rural areas, you know, they relate to issues of transportation or housing, but it's just there's kind of a, there, there's demographic headwinds that, that they're moving into. Now, one of the ways that employers have dealt with this issue is to invest in automated processes and technologies. And these technologies allow them to increase productivity and reduce headcount. Um, adopting these technologies, though, is not consistent throughout the industry. So almost about 40% uh, of our survey respondents indicated that they were not automating process, uh, they were not using automated processes, while another 40% uh, or so was either making significant investments uh, or planning to make uh, significant investments in, um, in automated technologies and processes. The biggest barrier for a lot of firms uh, was, was an inability to afford these technologies. And again, um, you know, that's a bit of a small firm problem. They can't afford uh, the upfront cost of, it, of, of it installing new systems, or they simply can't uh, assume the risk that comes if, if those uh, investments don't deliver as expected. The other barrier that, uh, that they indicated, about 35% of survey responses uh, uh, identified, was just broadband access. And that can come up in a lot of ways. For instance, I was down in Sykeston a couple months ago, um, and one of the the folks I was talking to down in Sykeston uh, told me about an app that was developed in Cape Girardeau called Pump Tracker that tracks irrigation systems. So it uh, lets farm operators know how long their irrigation systems have been on, how, um, um, you know, how much water they've used, that kind of information. And this could be really you know, useful information for farm operators if they can get a cell phone signal. Otherwise, it's not something they can, they can use. The other way uh, that a lot of these automated technologies can, can make a difference is for, uh, particularly in the manufacturing side of things, uh, is that they can change the demand for workers. So you may need fewer unskilled workers. Um, that's, you know, the goal a lot of times in terms of making these investments is to reduce your head count. So uh, that way you reduce turnover and the challenges of finding people is, is uh, uh, less difficult. But when you put a lot more machines in your facility, you need a lot more maintenance people. Um, and so it increases the pressure to find uh, people with those maintenance skills and, and that again brings you into direct competition with other manufacturer or other employers looking for people with those skills. So, you know, on one hand, you can solve one uh, workforce challenge and at the other, on the other hand, it kind of creates a handful of other um, you know, challenges that, that need to be addressed. Now, as we look at these challenges facing the state's food, ag, and forestry workforce, uh, there are a number of steps that we can take to address these issues and, and uh, and not all of them are expensive. Um, so first and foremost, we can continue to support and expand efforts to, to promote food, ag, and uh, forestry-related uh, careers. And here, uh, partners like FFA and 4-H, uh, our ag education programs are, are really important and need uh, continued uh, support. Another thing we can do is just uh, become get organized. Uh, and one of the ways that um, that uh, we can do that is through the use of sector strategies, which is a kind of a common term in the workforce world. Um, and sector strategies are basically a systematic approach to solving some specific problems. Um, and that involves partnerships between organizations like workforce and economic development agencies, 
uh, state agencies, education and training providers, employers, employer associations, organized labor, and bringing these groups together together to develop uh, and implement employer-driven solutions to their, some of their common workforce challenges. Um, so it's not a matter of just, uh, you know, oftentimes what happens when there's a, a workforce challenge uh, is that you know, one company may partner with one um, technical or community college to solve their specific problem. Um, but what we're looking for here is a more systematic approach that, that rather than solving the, the, the challenges of, of one employer, benefits the industry as a whole, and this requires time and collaboration. Uh, another thing that we can do is, is promote a lot of the existing uh, support initiatives and services that we have, and those, whether it's the state efforts to uh, expand apprenticeships within the state, uh, or one of the challenges that we heard in, in a lot of instances, whether it's in veterinary services or in uh, you know, small farms, is that these are small businesses and people are trained to be veterinarians or they're trained to be uh, farmers, but they don't necessarily pick up the business skills that they need to make their enterprises viable. And there are a lot of support services that are out there to help people, whether it's the Missouri Small Business Development Center, or if you get into the manufacturing space, Missouri Enterprise. And so making people aware of these support services, rather than creating new stuff, is just making better utilization of the, of the programs that we have is, is important. And then lastly, continuing, and this is probably the, the most expensive of these things, uh, these uh, these issues or items is is investing in our rural communities and we can hear uh, you know a lot about well, housing transportation schools uh, etc but from a business perspective um, I think the issue that comes up again and again is is kind of the need for broadband and that broadband is not a, an amenity um, it's really kind of essential infrastructure um, to really help uh, businesses take advantage of a lot of the new technologies that keep them uh, competitive uh, so with that uh, feel free to uh, ask any questions. I guess the one uh, additional thing that I would mention is that we're working on our report now. It's being currently being reviewed and, and then it'll go to a, once it's finalized, it'll go to a, a designer. So our report will be released in the next uh, month or month and a half. So keep, uh, keep an eye out for that. Excellent, Mark. Thank you so much for sharing those highlights from your research and we'll look forward to seeing the full report um, in a few months. If you do have a question, please go ahead and submit that in the chat screen, or you can also send me an email at roacham at missouri.edu. Uh, to kickstart our discussion here, Mark, I have a question about in what ways do you think that the coronavirus pandemic may have caused some of the findings here to somewhat shift since you conducted the research? Well, I think that, you know, the, 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 uh, the challenge with, with this is that it's thrown a, a, like a lot of, uh, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of unknowns that are there. And I think, you know, our goal with this was, was to look uh, at some of the longer, you know, current and longer term trends. And the hope is that when we return to normalcy that, um, you know, will um, a lot of the same challenges that came up in January and February will come back. I think when we look at how recessions have impacted kind of broadly food, ag and forestry in the past, food is a, uh, an inelastic good. So demand remains relatively uh, consistent throughout. Um, so there may be kind of losses in the short term, but the hope is that it'll come back and, and provide kind of steady employment and, and steady growth going forward. I think when you get into a little bit more specific um, kind of industries within food, ag, and forestry, I think there's reason to be uh, concerned when you think about industries like, um, like small uh, breweries or wineries that uh, where a lot of their sales uh, are you know on site, so either they're selling out of their facility or they're selling in restaurants. Um, and I think the you know how long they can survive um, uh, if this is a prolonged, um, um, you know, a prolonged uh, recession, depression, whatever we want to call it, uh, economic downturn. I, I think there's some real issues for con uh, for concern for some of those uh, folks. Um, and then I think, you know, just at the level of the firm, I think that, you know, the challenge for a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's maybe not as hard to find people. I mean, hiring is less of an issue now than it was uh, three months ago. Um, but I think the challenge for a lot of employers just individually uh, is, you know, figuring out how to, how to operate at a sufficient level at the same time, maintaining uh, kind of a safe work environment for their, uh, for their employees. And that applies whether you're a large meat processor or a, a small farm operation or the University of Missouri. So, um, you know, I think we, you know, we'll, we'll know more. Uh, and there's a it's highly uncertain environment at the moment. I think, uh, so we'll see how things shake out. But over the long term, I, you know, I, food, food should be steady. 
Great, thank you. What do you think may be the missing part in the role of extension in terms of training the new workforce specifically for the food, ag, and forestry industries, if there is one? <clears throat> so I think, you know, a, a, there's a handful of good roles for extension that's here. Obviously, you know, 4-H um, as kind of a core component of uh, of extension is a, is a critical partner in terms of engaging people. Um, I think that for extension agents, there's a lot of things that can be done when they're working with businesses. I think there's ways uh, that not only can they share information, be a connector uh, between um, businesses and potential resources or making people aware of opportunities. The other thing that they can do uh, as well is, is again, going back to the kind of the idea of being a connector is connecting uh, schools and businesses to help facilitate things like work-based learning opportunities that give, um, you know, is another way of, of getting students connected to, to opportunities or, or, or making them aware of the career possibilities that are there. So I think there's a lot of ways that, that extension, either through 4-H or the Small Business Development Centers or just the county engagement specialists as well, can play a role either in providing kind of direct services to youth, direct services to businesses, or making the connection uh, between all the partners involved. Sure, thank you. Uh, one of your slides indicated differences between create and compete jobs. So what are some examples of how food, ag, and forestry employers can make their jobs attractive to compete for workers who would have expertise that's demanded throughout the workforce? Well, I think there's, you know, it's, it's, there's, uh, there's a number of different scenarios that are there. And so, you know, one of the examples I'll give you is, uh, um, you know, on the compete side, oftentimes wages tend to be a little bit lower. So um, one of our, our team members uh, spoke to, a, to a, a, a sawmill outside of kind of in exurban or, or further out of St. Louis, and they would lose workers to the construction industry in St. Louis because um, uh, those, wait, those jobs paid more. Um, but I also spoke to another sawmill, for instance, who, um, you know, they again uh, had, you know, couldn't necessarily compete on wages, but they found that their workforce uh, actually liked uh, to to start earlier and work later. Uh, and so they changed the shifts that they have to start at six o'clock in the morning uh, and then end at three o'clock in the afternoon. And then they worked, so they basically were working nine hour days. Um, and then they had uh, a half day on Friday. So they had kind of a longer weekend. And so by uh, providing hours that were uh, kind of more amenable to their, uh, to their workforce, their workforce were, were more willing to uh, just found that to be attractive and it helped them solve at least some of their retention issues because they um, were kind of listening to the desires of their workforce. Sure. Yeah, so I think a lot of ways that employers can be creative about, um, you know, about some of what they do. Um, in other cases, there's, you know, there's certain uh, rigidities in, in food. If you, you know, you talk to a kind of a, a dairy, you know, someone who works at a, a dairy, well, people shop on weekends and, and milk is perishable, so they have less flexibility in their, their time their time frame, but I think there's a lot of different ways, not just on wages, that that uh, employers can compete. Great. Uh, one of your slides emphasized that most food, ag, and forestry jobs require experience in some cases, more so than post-secondary education. So is there an opportunity for high school curriculums to perhaps evolve to offer opportunities to gain the experience that employers have noted needing? Yeah, I, I think this is one uh, where uh, getting back to the idea of uh, work-based learning opportunities um, are really uh, important. And oftentimes these happen um, kind of in an ad hoc basis between, an, you know, an ag, uh, an ag education teacher might have a connection with a, uh, an employer. Um, but I think if we can find ways to make those um, opportunities, you know, systemize those opportunities a little bit more rather than just kind of based on relationships, mm -hmm. I think that's always a you know, a good thing to get students real um, work experience so that when they enter the workforce, they, they not only have an idea of, they have those, some of those, you know, they're aware of the work, the, the kind of the, the work readiness skills that they need, um, but they also have some basic experience working in those types of firms. So they have a little bit of a head start. So the more work-based learning opportunities we can create, the better off we are. Great. Um, the research overwhelmingly shows how food, ag, and forestry employers rely heavily on on-the-job training. So what are some types of resources that would help to make them more successful in offering on-the-job training that's effective in teaching the skills that their employees need to have? Yeah, um, you know, for on-the-job training, a lot of it's like experience and getting people involved and that, uh, you know, a lot of that, 
that comes from not just having people learn by doing, but you know, needing mentorship as well. Um, and I think there's also a number of short courses that, that are available, whether through education or training, you know, you know, community or technical colleges may provide um, some incumbent worker training uh, that would help um, not only build skills employees, but also build some of those uh, leadership skills that are, are needed as well. So um, I think, you know, it's going to vary from place to place, but I think those are, you know, it's not just teaching people how to do things, but it's also having people who know how to teach people how to do things. Got it. Um, your findings suggested that reliability and general work readiness are some skills that are difficult to find according to the employers who participated in your research. So are employers filling jobs regardless of whether they can find candidates with these types of skills or is the sentiment causing employers to leave job, jobs open or are they potentially foregoing opportunities for expansion because they can't find workers? Can you kind of give a situational analysis there for what you're seeing? So we, uh, we, we, did, ask, um, we did ask employers and, 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 and employers, seven, I think it was about 78% of uh, our survey respondents said that they hired people that didn't have, that, that weren't turnkey employees, that didn't necessarily have this, uh, the skills they needed, but then they trained them up. Um, and that was more than the statewide survey that was there. So, uh, so the answer is yes, they're continuing to, to, or at least they were, um, going back to you know, January into March, they, they were doing that. The other thing that I would add is that for larger employees, certainly, I think that's uh, a challenge. I, I, I spoke to one large um, uh, meat processor and they were, they, because they had, you know, they're trying to find a lot of people and they have a high amount of turnover. They had left some business kind of uh, on the table because they, they couldn't turn on some new machines they had because they simply didn't have enough people to be able to operate it and keep it operating. So I think that is a, that is a challenge. Now, you know, as we go forward, um, you know, there's all sorts of issues going, there's less, less demand, just generally speaking in the, in the economy. And there's, so there's a little bit less demand for, uh, for workers and people are less opportunities for people to leave. So turnover should presumably be down. But I think when the economy is moving along, then yes, finding people um, to fill these jobs. I mean, that, that, that can be a real constraint on business growth, uh, particularly, as I mentioned, in, in more rural areas where there's just simply not uh, people. Right. Uh, one last question for you. You mentioned how engaging with youth is particularly important in order to build that talent pipeline. So in your research, did employers indicate what types of efforts they found to be most effective? I know you looked into the types of methods that they're using, but did they indicate effectiveness of the different methods they're using to build talent? <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I, I go back a little bit to um, in some of the conversations that we had in terms of talking with about like groups like FFA, for instance, and, and there were some employers that specifically said uh, or indicated that they look to hire people uh, who participated in FFA um, because, uh, you know, not only did they have an interest in agriculture, uh, not only, uh, but they were also, you know, those groups tend to um, instill within um, uh, younger people and students some of those kind of work-ready skills or leadership skills that they're looking for as well. And so it's kind of a uh, kind of a pre-selected pool from which to pull from. So if they could recruit through those, through those, uh, those groups, they were, you know, they were happy to do so. Um, so that was seen as kind of an effective way. Um, less effective, I think, were industry tours. There's some, you know, some, some companies that said, yeah, we do industry tours and it's good to expose people to it. We've never uh, actually hired people uh, because they went on an industry tour, but they, I think they looked at it as, as, uh, as um, you know, kind of just one small piece of a broader part of, of, of interesting, you know, uh, stimulating interest in whether it's manufacturing, generally speaking, or in agriculture as, as being important. Um, I would imagine that industry tours are one of those, you know, facility tours are one of those things that are um, probably going to go on hiatus here for the next uh, a year or more. But, um, um, you know, they were good in, in generating interest, if not, but not necessarily leading to specific, I mean, hiring uh, people specifically. Great. Well, thank you, Mark, so much for sharing today's webinar presentation, and thank you to our audience, too.
When you exit Zoom, you'll see a post webinar survey will load in your browser. If you could please consider responding, we'll use the results to improve the webinar experience and also brainstorm future webinar topics. Again, you should receive a recording of today's webinar via email within about a day from now. Our next Engaging for Missouri webinar is scheduled for Friday. At that time, Dr. Amanda Alexander, who is an assistant teaching professor with our hospitality management program, will speak about hosting virtual events. So again, thanks so much for joining us and enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you.